I had intended this to be the last uh, sermon in this series, but because it would have ended up being quite long, um, I'm going to extend that out to next Sunday. So next Sunday, Lord willing, hopefully will be the end of the series on suffering and deliverance. Uh, if you'll remember last time, and, and for the last month or more, we've been looking at the life of the Apostle Paul, going through the book of Acts, and seeing all of the times that he suffered and then was delivered by the Lord. Uh, and I haven't even kept track of them all, but it's it's got to be up in the over a dozen, I would think, at this point. And if you'll remember last time, he had made it in front of Festus. He'd been in front of Felix, the governor first, and then he was in front of Festus, and Festus was offering to send him back to Jerusalem, seeing if he would go to Jerusalem to be tried because he wanted to placate the Jews. And Paul knew better that he wouldn't get a fair shake down there, so he appealed to Caesar's judgment seat. And Festus said, Hast thou appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar shalt thou go. So Paul was headed to Rome to be tried at Caesar's court. And that's where we're going to pick up today. He did have a brief stint there in front of King Agrippa, which I'm not going to talk about, as I mentioned last time, because he didn't uh, really suffer any persecution of King Agrippa. He tried to convince him to be a Christian, and he wasn't quite ready for that. So after seeing King Agrippa, he was uh, put on a ship and sent off to Rome, and we're going to look at that for this week and then the first part of next week. So you can turn to Acts chapter 27. Acts 27. This is a really interesting story to look at, and there's some very powerful, practical points that can be drawn out of this story, Um, things that I hadn't, uh, maybe the overarching practical point that I had seen before, but the specifics I hadn't really noticed until I went through this, that it's like every single verse you can make practical application to our lives. Um, if you'll hear it. So it's pretty interesting. So like I said, after being heard by King Agrippa, Paul is sent off to Rome in this ship with a bunch of other prisoners, 276 of them, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, Acts 27 and verse 1. It says, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band a Roman centurion. And apparently Luke was with him because you notice the use of the pronoun there, we. Uh, We should sail into Italy. Uh, So Luke was with him at least up until this point. He might have been with him the whole way to Rome. I can't remember because we know that Luke was the one that wrote the book of Acts. So things went, when they first got on the ship and they started to sail, things went okay. They didn't go great because it is later in the year, as we'll see here in a minute. It was probably... October, November-ish, and and I can show you why that is here in a minute. So, not the best time for sailing, and especially when you're sailing with sails, and you're depending on the wind and all that. uh, But we'll just read through the next few verses here, and you'll see that it was okay, but but not the greatest. Uh, Verses 2 through 8. And entering into a ship of uh, Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, Zidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. You know, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. This is a Roman centurion that's in charge of, of keeping Paul as a prisoner. And Paul apparently made such an impression on this guy, and Paul's reputation preceded himself, that when he gets someplace, rather than being tied up in the ship like the rest of the prisoners, he allows him to go out and run around and see his friends and enjoy himself, and because he knows he's going to come back. He knows he's not going to jump ship, so to speak, and, um, and get the centurion in trouble. Verse 4, And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. So they had to detour a bit because the winds weren't taken where they wanted to go. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. 
And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Sol uh, Salomni. Salo uh, Salomni, something like that. And hardly passing it, came unto a place where, uh, which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. So you see there that they're, they've been wanting to go here. They couldn't really go here. They had to go to a different place. The winds were contrary at first. Then the winds were slow. And they're just not, things aren't going the greatest. And time is running out. And Paul perceives that this journey is not going to go well. Now, whether this was direct revelation from God, it doesn't say. It could have just been because Paul had some wisdom, and Paul could look around and say, you know what, this probably isn't going to turn out well. But for whatever reason, he was, he was certain that this was not going to go well, and he warned them, uh, the, the centurion and the shipmaster, warned them that we're not going to get through this without much damage to the ship and harm to our own lives. They didn't listen, though, but we'll get to that in a second. Verses 10 and 11. Now, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. Let me just, just stop there for a second. The fast was now already passed. I couldn't prove this absolutely, but uh, in the Cambridge, there's a note, there's a, a uh, marginal note there, and it says the fast was the 10th day of the 7th month. And then they cite Leviticus 23 and verse 27. And you go there, and it's talking about the Day of Atonement. And during the Day of Atonement, it was they were said, and you can go read that verse. Actually, I'll just read it to you. Uh, in Leviticus 23 and verse 27, it says that they were to afflict their souls, which is what is, of, which is, what is said when people fast. And I could show you that with comparative scripture. Um, in Leviticus 23 and verse 27, it says also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And like I said, I don't have one off the tip of my tongue, but there are a number of verses in the Bible that talk about afflicting yourself with fasting. So, pretty good uh, reason to think that this is referring to that day of atonement as the fast. But regardless, we can prove later on, and the Day of, Aton day of Atonement was the seventh month. You count seven months, and the Jewish month started in the springtime around March or April. Not exactly sure which month it was. So you're looking at October, November, and later on it says that, um, that w the winter was upon them, that they were going that they were gonna need to winter somewhere. So anyway, they are in late fall, getting close to winter. The sailing is not good anymore. It's dangerous, and Paul warns them in verse 10 and said unto them sirs i perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage not only to the lading of the ship but also to our own to our uh, but also of our lives so there's going to be a shipwreck here and not only is the ship going to suffer much damage so are we so he's warning them let's stop right here let's not go any further if you want to be prudent well, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than Paul. After all, what's Paul know? He's just a preacher. Oh, I'm going to listen to that preacher. He doesn't know anything, right? Well, you'll see what happened when you don't listen to the preacher if the preacher's right. Uh, Acts 27 and verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. He appealed to the authorities, right? To the smart people, right? The owner of the ship, he must know everything. The, the, uh, the captain of the ship, he knows more than Paul does, clearly. So he defers to him. And this is typical of unbelievers, but it's not just typical of unbelievers. It's typical of a lot of Christians, too. To heed the advice of worldly people and experts, quote-unquote, rather than a man of God warning from the word of God. How many people will go to the experts and trust the experts rather than the preacher giving them the verse? They'll go to the psychologist and listen to their drivel rather than the preacher giving them the verse. Right? They'll go to the 
financial counselors and listen to their nonsense and how they should take on all this debt rather than listen to the preacher give them the word of God, right? They'll go to the family counselor and they'll listen to their nonsense rather than listen to the preacher give them the word of God, right? They'll, they'll always defer to the experts and they'll suffer for it. So they took the advice of the majority. Now, when I say listen to the preacher, I am referring when the preacher is giving you the word of God. Now, if I'm just giving you my opinion, you say, hey, what do you think about quantum theory? And I say, well, I think it's a bunch of nonsense. Okay, well, who cares what I think if, right, if, if it's just my opinion? But if I'm giving you the, a verse of what God says, that's a whole different story. It's not my opinion anymore. People will play it off as my opinion because then it's easy to reject, but that's not my opinion. When I give you the verse, that's God's. God's thought, not mine. So they took the advice of the majority, and they decided to sail on. Verse 12. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phineci, and, and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. So they had a little council here, and the majority, said the more part, the majority decided, no, preacher's wrong, we know better, let's keep sailing. This is not a good place to winter. That preacher doesn't know what he's talking about. What does the preacher know about sailing anyway? He didn't know anything, right? Forget the fact that God might have actually told him that. How else would Paul know for sure? Why, why would he be so certain that they were going to suffer much damage? Paul's a prophet after all, remember? But that preacher didn't know anything. So they get, the, they get the majority together and decide the preacher's full of it. We'll just go with what we want to do. You want to beware of following a multitude to do evil. It doesn't matter if it's the majority. It doesn't matter if it's everybody and you're the only one that is going against the grain. Do not follow a multitude to do evil. Exodus 23 and verse 2. Sadly, this is what most people do. Most people follow the crowd. They do whatever everybody else is doing because most people do not want to stand out. They do not want to be the oddball. They don't want to have people look at them weird. They just want to fit in. So they follow the multitude and do whatever evil the multitude does. Exodus 23 and verse 2, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. So the multitude said that Paul was wrong. We ought to keep sailing. And guess what? The multitude were wrong. The majority were wrong. Following the crowd is almost always wrong. We are not supposed to be conformed to this world. Look at Romans chapter 12. In verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. In verse 1, he starts and he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world. The shipmaster, the owner of the ship, the, the captain, they were being conformed to this world. The opinions of the majority on that ship ruled the day. They weren't going to listen to what the preacher said. They weren't going to listen to what the word of God said. They were going to listen to what the experts told them. Like I said, following the crowd is almost always wrong. And I just have some searching questions for you that I jotted down this morning as I was thinking about this. Are you normal? Are you normal? I mean, it depends on what you mean by that. I mean, I'm not talking about like abnormal, like mentally unstable, but are you normal? If somebody looked at you and they're like, that's just an average guy, he just looks like everybody else, talks like everybody else, does everything that everybody else does, he's totally normal do you fit in with the world around you do you rub shoulders with the people of this world do you just feel like you're among family 
or do you feel like you're a stranger and a pilgrim and a sojourner and you just feel like you don't fit in quite because you don't think like they do, you don't do like they do, you don't like doing the things that they do, you don't like talking about the things they like talking about, you don't think their jokes are funny, whatever. Do you fit in or do you stick out? If someone were to see the way that you live, would it stand out to them? If they could took a, take a broad look, took a broad view of your life, would they look and say, yeah, he's just, just an average, normal guy? Or would they say, there's something different about that guy. He does not do things the same way that most people do them. Would you just look like everyone else, or would you look different? How do you speak? You speak like everybody else does? You use the same kind of language everybody else does? How do you spend your money? Like everybody else? You go into debt like everybody else? What kind of entertainment do you enjoy? Same thing everybody else does? You like the same kind of movies everybody else does? Same kind of TV shows everybody else does? Listen to the same kind of music everybody else does? I don't. You know why? Because I don't listen to music. I'm not saying you have. You, you can't. But generally, I never turn on the radio in the car. I don't. I just don't, I don't know, I get, I get better things to do, and most of it's just garbage anyway. All that stuff, there's subliminal messaging and all that garbage. I don't watch the same TV programs that everybody else does, because I don't watch TV. I haven't had TV for 17 years. Now, you don't have to draw your lines exactly where I draw mine, and you don't have to be a carbon copy of me, but you might want to ask yourself, if my pastor got rid of his TV 17 years ago and has never desired to have one again. Why is that? Why would he get rid of that thing and never want to watch it again? And I don't, when I go to a hotel room and there's a big screen TV in there as there always is, I never turn it on. And as a matter of fact, and I'm not exaggerating, I don't even think about turning it on. Like, I'm not even joking. The thought never even crosses my mind to turn on the TV when there is one there. Never happens. Because that stuff on there is garbage. The commercials, the shows, everything on there is garbage filling your minds. We would have never had this so-called pandemic if it weren't for the TV. It would have never happened. People wouldn't have got into this hysteria if they wouldn't have been watching their stupid TV. I was just thinking about this today. I'll just up the ante on how serious I am about it. If somebody gave me two choices, I'm either going to shoot you in the head right now, or you can take a TV and put it in your house, and you have to watch it for at least an hour a day. Kid you not, I'll take one to the head. You think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. So you might want to just ponder, why would your pastor feel so strongly about something like that? How about your smartphone addiction? If somebody looked at you, would they see any difference in your smartphone addiction than the smartphone addiction of the other 330 some odd million people in this country? Or would they see you carrying it around with you every single place you go that you don't go 10 feet before your smartphone is in your pocket? When you sit at a restaurant, and people are looking around, are they seeing you on your smartphone when you're with other people, or you're anywhere with other people? Are they seeing you being social and actually talking? You'll stand out, you know that? If you just talk to people these days, you'll stand out if you're not on your phone all the time. How about your family life? Would they notice any difference there? Do you have biblical family roles? Husband's provider, wife stays at home with the kids? Or do they see you doing what everybody else does? How do your children behave? They throw fits at the grocery store? Do they defy you in public like everybody else's or most other people's kids do? Are they brain-dead zombies on their phones everywhere they go? Or are they different? Follow not a multitude to do evil. Nothing wrong with being different, as a matter of fact. If you're different, you're probably 
in the right because the way of the majority is usually wrong. And I will give you some verses which will prove this. The way of the majority is usually wrong. Matthew 7 and verse 13. Matthew 7 and verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, straight is narrow and constricted, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Most people are on the broad way. Most people are heading to destruction. There are few on the straight and narrow way. That's why if you live according to the, the precepts of the Bible, if you live biblically, you are going to look strange to people around you because you are on the straight and narrow way. You are not in the broad way with everybody else. Just picture two highways, and there's all these people walking down this one side of the highway, a whole group of people, and you know what? They are all indistinguishable from each other. Yeah, maybe they're wearing a different colored shirt or something, but you look at them, and they're pretty much, it's just a mass of people. You wouldn't even notice one out of the crowd. And then you got the other side of the highway, and you got this one guy walking down there all by himself. That's the Christian. This is the world. He's different. He's off there by himself. You remember what it was in Elijah's day, 1 Kings 18, 21 through 22? Let's see if it would have paid off to be following the crowd in Elijah's day. 1 Kings 18, 21 through 22. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I... Even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. 450 to 1. And there was another 400 prophets of the grove. 850 to 1 against Elijah. Now, if Elijah was like the sissy people that we have today, like a lot of Christians, he'd have been over there hanging out with the 850. I don't want to stand over here by myself. I'd feel weird. I want to be over here with the 850, but not Elijah. Elijah didn't hang out with the 850. Elijah killed the 850. You remember that? He was right, and they were all wrong. The vast majority of the religious world here was wrong, and Elijah was right. You remember in the days of Noah, I'll just turn over to First Peter, who was right, who was wrong? It was eight versus millions. Surely the millions couldn't be wrong, could they? The whole world couldn't be wrong and one little preacher with a church of seven other people, a total of eight, one little preacher in a church of eight people, certainly he couldn't be right in the whole world be wrong, could they? First Peter 3 and verse 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Turn over to Second Peter 2 in verses 5 through 8. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. He was the preacher. He was the pastor of this little church of eight people bringing in the flood of the world upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that should after, that after should live ungodly. You think about that. The days of Noah, the whole world was wrong. When Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, the whole city was wrong. At least, there weren't ten of them that weren't wrong. There weren't ten. Remember Abraham... Reasoned with God and got down to 10. God said he wouldn't destroy it for 10. A city of, I'm sure, thousands of people at least, or tens of thousands. Who knows? It was, I'm sure it was a large city, and it was cities of the plains. So it was other cities around there. Thousands of people, and they're all wrong. They're all wrong. 
If you try to figure out how you should act and what you should do by looking at people around you and emulating them, you're wrong too. Because they're all wrong. Chances are about most everything. Look at 2 Timothy 4 and verse 16. Just really trying to drive this point home. To be not conformed to this world, don't follow the majority. Whether in any area of life, for the most part, especially in religion and matters relating to God, but in, in many other areas. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 16. Paul says that my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Paul was all alone. He was right, and the rest of them were wrong. And then let me give you one more. There is coming a day, Revelation 13 and verse 3, when the whole world is going to be wrong. They are going to be following a false religion, a false god, believing and worshiping a beast. And who knows how close we are to that now. We don't know. We could be quite close or it could be a long ways away. But there's coming a day when that's going to happen. Revelation 13 and verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And then they that wouldn't worship him are to be killed, you read later on in the chapter. There's coming a day when the whole world is going to be following a false religious system and a false prophet and you're going to have to make your decision. Am I going to go along with them? Or am I going to follow God? You see, the people on the ship, they went along. The, the rulers, the, the leaders of the ship, they went around, along with the people instead of going with the man of God. Paul was the lone voice of reason. But they're not going to listen to that preacher. They're going to listen to what everybody else says. They're going to follow the crowd. Well, here's something really interesting that happens. Turn back to Acts chapter 27. This is very, very curious. After they decided to go against the counsel of the man of God, the sailing conditions actually improve. You think, oh, that's interesting. Paul must have been wrong. You see, if you look at circumstances and say, oh, well, circumstances are good, therefore what I'm doing is good. You're an idiot. If you think, oh, things are going well in my life, I must be doing well, you're an idiot. You've got to look at, are you doing the right thing or not? It doesn't matter how good things are going in your life or how bad things are going in your life. If you look at your circumstances and determine whether you are right or wrong, you are a fool. The scripture determines whether you're right or wrong, not how well or how badly your life is going. Acts 27 and verse 13. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. So Paul tells them, I perceive that this sailing is going to be with much damage to the, to the ship and to our own persons. The chief captain, the captain, he, he goes with the owner of the ship. He's not going to listen to Paul. Then they get a little council and they convene and everybody else decides, no, Paul's wrong. So they all decide, Paul's wrong, we're going to keep sailing. And up until that point, the winds had been contrary. Things had been going very well, right? And they decide, we're going to go against the counsel of the, of the man of God, speaking the word of God, and we're going to do it our way. And they set sail. And the sun comes out, the winds blow nice, and everything is going perfectly. And they think, see, that idiot preacher thinks he's always right. He thinks, yeah, everything he says is right. He doesn't know anything. Stupid preacher. Look at this. Everything is going great. Clearly, God is blessing our act of disobedience. Obviously, he's blessing us because the weather is so great. Wind's just blowing softly. We've obtained our purpose. We're going to be in Rome before you know it. That preacher is an idiot. Don't listen to what he says. God will often give circumstances that seem to confirm men's wrong decisions as a judgment against them for rejecting his word. You know he does that? The, the Lord will give you something in his word or he'll give it to you through his preacher preaching his word and you reject it and then the Lord will send blessing in your life to confirm you in your disobedience to deceive you. He'll do that. You say, well, that's not nice. That's how God judges people. God says, oh, you want to have it your way? I'll, I'll give it your way, and I'll even make you think that your way is the right way. And that way, your fall is going to be that much 
worse when you finally do fall. You remember a prophet named Jonah? Jonah was told by the Lord to go to Nineveh and tell them to repent. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go preach to those Gentiles. Jonah knew that the Lord would have mercy on them, and he didn't like that idea. Jonah wanted to flee from the presence of the Lord, and so he does that. Jonah 1, verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up and uh, to flee unto Tarshish, not Nineveh. Not Nineveh, different place, to Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord, he's going in the opposite direction of where the Lord tells him to go. And went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord says, go to Nineveh. Nineveh. Jonah says, I want to go to Tarshish. Jonah goes down to Joppa, down to the sea, And what does he find? A ship heading to Tarshish. And what does Jonah conclude? You can can bet that Jonah says, Yep, confirmation, the Lord wants me to go to Tarshish. Even though the Lord said he wants me to go to Nineveh, but when I came down here to Joppa and there's a ship going to Tarshish, clearly my circumstances tell me the Lord wants me to go to Tarshish. The opposite of what he said, I know God told me to do this, but I want to do this, this other thing. And guess what? Everything's just falling into place. Like, I wanted to do this thing, and just everything worked out, and I'm able to do this thing that I wanted to do, except God said, do something else. God said, don't do that thing. But when I did this thing, everything fell right into place. And a lot of people will think, well, you know, apparently, God really doesn't want me to do what he told me to do. Apparently, it doesn't matter what that preacher preached from the Word of God, because I'm doing something different. and Things are going great for me. Everything's wonderful. God's even opened doors for me to walk through to pursue my disobedience and blessed me. That's what happened to Jonah. You know what else happened to Jonah? Do I need to tell you what happened to Jonah? Yeah, he got in the ship going to Tarshish, right? The opposite direction he was supposed to go. And guess what? A storm came. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about storms coming. When you don't obey the Word of God, you don't obey the preaching of the Word of God that's coming from the Word of God, there's a storm coming. You know what happened to Jonah? Big storm. You know what they did? They ended up having to throw Jonah overboard. Jonah got swallowed up by a fish, a whale. Spent three days in the whale's belly until he figured out that God's in control and he ought to listen to what God says and not do what he wants to do. Turn to Jeremiah 44, 16 through 17. Jeremiah 44, 16 through 17. It says, And the word that thou hast spoken, this is the word coming from Jeremiah to these people, telling them to turn from idolatry, worship the true God. And the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes. Everybody's doing it. I mean, we're not the only ones. The fathers, the kings, the princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, all the people, everybody's doing it, right? We're not the only ones. Everybody else can't be wrong, can they? For then we had plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. They say to the man of God, he just got done preaching to him what God says. They say, you know what? You, what you told us to do from the Bible, you know what? We're not going to do that. We're going to do whatever we want to do. We're going to do what we have been doing because when we were doing it our way, we had plenty of vittles. Everything was going wonderfully. But you know what happened when we stopped doing what we weren't supposed to do and started doing what we were supposed to do, when we started actually obeying what the Bible says and what the preacher says when he's preaching from the Bible, you know what happened? Bad stuff happened. Verse 18. But since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, since we stopped the idolatry and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. Look, 
When we were doing the right thing, we, or when we were doing the wrong thing, when we were serving the Queen of Heaven, we had lots of victuals, lots of food. Everything was going great when we were being idolaters. As soon as we started listening to that preacher, right, and we started worshiping the true God, we've been consumed by the sword and by the famine. Everything's been going badly when we started listening to that preacher. We're not going to listen to that preacher anymore. We're going to do it our way. I'm going to do what I want to do because when I do what I want to do, Things go better. That's what they thought. You can imagine how that turned out. Remember what happened to Israel after that? A storm came. It was called the storm of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and their city was completely wiped out and they were all destroyed. Be very afraid if your life is going well, if you are knowingly rejecting the counsel of the word of God and the preacher who is preaching it. Let me say it again. Be very afraid if your life is going well, if you are knowingly rejecting the counsel of the word of God and the preacher who is preaching it. You are headed for a storm. You say, oh, you know, the preacher said this. The pre- I mean, yeah, he preached this sermon. I, yeah, he gave me lots of verses on it, but I don't want to do that. And really... Things are going well. Things are going great for me. You're headed for a storm. You've got a shipwreck in your future. Now, you know what happens when the preacher preaches. He gives you the sermon. He gives you the word of God. Tells you what you ought to do. And you don't do it. You do your own thing. And nothing happens for a while. And the judgment stayed. And everything just seems like it's okay. There's usually two responses to that. The full says in his heart, now the preacher warned me against this, but it's worked out just fine so far, so I've got nothing to worry about. Yeah, yeah, the preacher, he warned about, I've been hearing him warning about this forever, but everything's been fine. i got nothing to worry about, I'm not worried about it. The preacher obviously doesn't know what he's talking about. That's what the fool does, that's the first response. The second response is from the fool who is wised up. They're both fools, I mean, they both went against the word of God, but the fool who is wised up, he'll say to himself, the preacher warned me against this, And I haven't suffered the consequences yet, so I better not impose on the long-suffering of God any further and repent before judgment inevitably comes. One of them says, hey, I've been doing this for a long time. Nothing's happened. Obviously, the preacher's wrong. I'm going to be fine. The other one says, you know what? I've been doing this for a long time. Thankfully, nothing's happened yet. I better clean up my act. I better repent because it's going to come. The judgment's going to come because God's word says that's what happens. I'm going to change course here. I've gotten away with it this long. I'm not going to push my luck any further. Unfortunately, if a fool gets away with something for a time, it usually emboldens him to continue in his folly rather than humbles him. Turn with me to Proverbs 14 and verse 16. This is the problem. This is what happens. You make a foolish decision. You go against the word of God. Things seem to go well. And instead of saying, you know what? I got away with it for a while, but I'm going to stop now before it's too late. Most of them say, I got away with it. Full speed ahead. Proverbs 14 and verse 16. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil. That's the second guy. He realizes, wait a minute. You know, I've been involved in evil and I haven't gotten busted yet. I'm going to stop now before it's too late. That's what the wise man does. But the fool rageth and is confident. Full speed ahead for the fool. I've gotten away with it up until now. Everything's cool. Isaiah 26 and verse 10. Isaiah 26 and verse 10. God can show favor. To even a way, to, well, to a, it says a wicked person in this case. God will show favor to a wicked person. He's not going to change him for the better. It's not going to make him reconsider his ways. Isaiah 26 and verse 10, it says, Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. God can show a little favor to him. Won't change him. He's still not going to do what he's supposed to. Now back to Acts chapter 27 and verse 14. So they had made their decision, which was contrary to the word of God from the man of God, taking the advice of the experts rather than the preacher. 
They set sail and things are going smoothly. Everything looks like they're just stars are aligned. Everything's falling right into place. But not long after being confirmed in their foolish decision by apparently fortuitous events, reality strikes and a terrible storm besets them. This is what I'm telling you. This is what I'm warning you against. The storm coming. Verse 27. But not long after, there arose against it a, tem- a, against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. Not long after. They just set sail and the clouds disappear and there's a nice soft breeze and it's just beautiful weather and they think, Whew, that preacher was wrong. And it doesn't last hardly any time and all of a sudden, a horrible tempest comes on them and they're like, oh man, he was right. They probably didn't say he was right. They can't, they're not going to figure that out for a long time because that's how stupid people are. It takes them a while. So what's the lesson? If you reject the counsel of a man of God from the word of God, expect a storm in your future. Now that storm could be a financial storm. It could be a psychological storm. It could be a relational storm. It could be a storm within your own, within your family or your friendships. It could be a storm with your children. You don't have to go very far to talk to people to find out about storms arising from their children, causing them all kinds of grief and headache. It could be a legal storm. It could be a marital storm. It could be a spiritual storm. It could be a storm in the church. Any one of these storms in life can occur when you don't heed the preaching of the Word of God from the Word of, from the, yeah, the preaching of the Word of God. Now, I could give you specific examples. I could get down to the nitty gritty, but I'm actually not going to do that. I could. I really could. But I'm not going to do that. There's the odd person that'll hear a specific story and say, you know what, that doesn't specifically apply to me, but I can see the application. I can can make an application from that to my own life. There's the rare person that'll do that. But you know what most people will do? If I wouldn't describe their specific situation to a T, they would look at that and say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I mean, that's something else, right? They could, they can't put two and two together and say, oh, well, you know, yeah, that doesn't, that one doesn't specifically apply to me, but there's one just like it that does. So I'm just going to leave it general for you. There's a storm coming. You disobey the word of God, which is preached unto you. There's a storm coming. It may be smooth sailing for a while, but it's not going to last. When this happens, Instead of blaming themselves for rejecting God's counsel, most people will blame God for the consequences of their foolish decisions. Turn turn to Proverbs 19 and verse 3. So here's what usually happens. The preacher preaches a sermon. You hear it and say, you know, I don't like that. That's not what I want to do. I want to do something else that's going to make me a lot happier. I'm going to do something different. And you do something different and then all of a sudden the storm comes, and you're right in the middle of a horrible tempest, and then you know what you do? You know what you do? God, why did you let this happen to me? Do you really love me? Why would you let this happen to me if you love me? They blame God for it. Blame God for the consequences of their own foolishness. Proverbs 19 and verse 3, The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. It wasn't God that perverted your way. It was you. When you suffer for your foolish decisions, know that you are the cause of your suffering, not God. You. When you are suffering, when you are enduring the storm because you rejected the word of God, know that it is you. You are the problem, not God. Psalm 107 and verse 17. Psalm 107 and verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Not because God's doing it for the fun of it. It's because of their transgressions and afflictions. It's because of their foolish decisions that they're suffering affliction. That's why they're in the storm. Go back to Acts 27. 
So the storm is so fierce that they can't control the ship anymore. And they were forced to just let that ship go wherever the winds took it. They were out of control. Acts 27 and verse 15. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. I'm sure that they worked and worked, and they rode, and they did everything that they possibly could to try to keep that ship going the direction that they wanted it to go. But guess what? Reality struck. Those winds were far more powerful than they, and they finally just had to let go, and it was they were going to go wherever the winds took them, regardless of where they wanted to go. So what's the lesson? Instead of heeding instruction and remaining in control of your life. Because you know that if you heed God's instruction, you will have a limited amount of control in your life. You will be able to direct your life, you know, in in general, in small things anyway, to generally where you want to go. Of course, God's always still in control. But when you obey God's commandments, he gives you a lot of latitude. And you can make the decisions and you can go where you want to go. And you can work where you want to work. And you can marry who you want to marry. There's all kinds of things that you can do if you keep within God's commandments. But when you start going against that, all of a sudden, all that's taken away and you are going to go where God wants you to go for a judgment and a punishment against you and you will have no control over it. All of a sudden, you're not in the driver's seat. You're in the passenger seat. You're in the back seat on a horrible drive somewhere and you can do nothing but just grasp on and try to hold on for dear life. Reality will step in, it will take control, and you will go where the winds of the storm take you, contrary to your desires. You reject the word of God, and one of these days, reality is going to hit you like a two-by-four between the eyes. Oh yeah, you get away with it for a while. People often do. But eventually, reality strikes like a two-by-four. And it doesn't matter what you want. You're not going to get what you want. Reality is going to overwhelm your desires. Well, they tried to get to land by boat, but they were not able. Verses 16 through 17. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. They couldn't do it. They tried to get get into the boat, get to land, and they're just not able. They just can't they, they can't get out of the storm. They want to get out of the storm, but it's too late. Now if they would have just listened in the first place, they'd have never been in the storm. But once you don't listen and you're in the storm, you're in it. And you're not going to get out of it until God's done with you. After the storm has come, your efforts to escape from it will not be successful and you will be forced to suffer the consequences of your decisions. Well, the next day, the storm was so bad that they had to throw out the cargo to lighten the ship. See, things are just getting worse and worse and worse. Notice what they have not done yet. They haven't repented. They haven't said, Paul, you were right. Preacher, you were right. Boy, was I stupid for not listening to what you said. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. No, they're not going to do that. The next day, it's so bad, they've got to throw the cargo out. Verse 18. And we, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship which means they're just throwing stuff out. All the, all the car, whatever they're hauling to Rome with them, I'm sure they have not only passengers, but they're taking other things. They're probably shipping, you know, goods and whatever. They're just throwing all that stuff out just to try to survive. What's the lesson? Well, when you get into the storm of life that was caused by your disobedience, you will be forced by circumstances to give up things dear to you to try to survive the storm. Now, all of a sudden, you've got to get rid of stuff. Imagine the person that gets himself so deeply in debt. I mean, this is an obvious case. You get yourself so deeply in debt and you get into a storm and all of a sudden 
you got to start giving up stuff. You got to get rid of the car. You got to get rid of the toys. You got to get rid of all this stuff because you've gone way in over your head. You got all this credit card debt, right? You, you are a mess financially. And guess what? The stuff that you really love and you wanted for so many years and you bought all that stuff on debt, guess what? It's gone. You lost all that stuff that you loved so much. You had to throw it overboard. You're just hoping to stay above water. You're hoping that this ship doesn't sink and you got to start getting rid of stuff. That's just one example. Don't think that's the only example, okay? That's just one example. Well, then the third day, things even get worse yet. And they have to start throwing out the tackling of the ship. Acts 27 and verse 19. And the third day, we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. First, it was the cargo. Right? It was just it was the stuff that, that was precious to us, but not absolutely necessary. It's just it's a it's a sad day to see all this stuff go, but you know, not a big deal. Now they're throwing out the tackling. You use the tackling when you are coming into port, when you're anchoring, right? I mean tackling is necessary, and I don't know what else for but I'm sure tackling is necessary stuff for the ship. Now you're throwing out necessary things. Right? Now you're not just getting rid of the big expensive car and all the toys and all this stuff. Now you're getting rid of your furniture. You're getting rid I mean, you are just going down to the bare bones. You even lose your house. Your house is gone now because you're just trying to somehow still feed yourself. And now you're off living in some little place that you didn't want to live because you had to get rid of your house. Right? Just to use one example. Throwing out the tackling. Giving up, being forced to give up necessary things in an attempt to weather the storm. Well, they spent many days in the storm, not being able to see the sun or the stars for navigation, to the point that all hope was lost. It just keeps going. I mean, it gets worse and worse and worse. And now there are many, many days. They don't know where they are. They don't know where this is ever going to end or if it's going to end. They don't know if they're going to die at sea. And they just have no hope anymore. Acts 27 and verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. I'll bet you Luke was about ready to wring a neck. Probably, you idiots, why didn't you listen to the preacher? You bunch of fools. If you'd have listened to the preacher, we wouldn't be in this situation. Now look at us. We are screwed because you guys wouldn't listen to the word of God. Of course, I'm just making this up, but I can just imagine what Luke would have thought. I know what I would have thought. If I'd have been there thinking that Paul's right, if I'd have been on the side of the preacher and the rest of these morons weren't, and now we're in this horrible storm, I would not be a happy camper. God may let the storm buffet you for a long time until you've lost all hope of being delivered from it. He'll probably let you be buffeted in a storm until you finally admit, I was a fool. I didn't listen. I did my own thing. I did what I wanted to do, not what the preacher preached to me from the Word of God. I didn't do what God said. I did what I wanted to. Until you break down and admit, I am an idiot, the storm will continue. Well, Paul kept his mouth shut for a long time, but then he finally tells them, I told you so. Essentially, if it was a modern version, it would probably say, Paul said, I told you so. right? Because that's what he said, in essence. Acts 27, 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. I mean, this has been going on for a long time, and he's just been thinking, I told you so, I told you so. If you morons would have listened to me, we wouldn't be in this situation. But he waits for a long time. They've already cast out the cargo. They've cast out the tackling. They've, it's gone on so long now that everybody's wondering. I mean, they, they think the hope is lost. We're all going to die. Paul waits for all that time, and then he finally steps in and says, I told you so. Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me. In other words, I told you so. You should have listened to what I told you. And not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. People always say, Oh, you shouldn't say I told you so. It's rude to say I told you so. Why? 
It's rude to rub salt in a wound. Why? Some wounds need salt rubbed in them so people don't forget. When you've done something stupid and boneheaded and you knew it, and somebody comes along and rubs salt in that wound, you deserve it so you won't forget. Don't be surprised if the man of God whose warning you rejected later tells you, I told you so, after calamity has struck. Now, a good preacher is not just going to leave it at that. He's not just going to leave it at, I told you so. And he's not just going to keep rubbing it in. He's going to rub it in for a while. I mean, he's going to stick that dagger in and twist for a while until it really hurts. But then he's going to take it out and patch it up. I mean, he's not, going to, he's not just going to continue doing that forever. Paul then comforts him after that. And he tells him that the ship's going to be lost, but their lives are going to be spared. Acts 27 and verse 22. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. The, the, the shipmaster that made the decision to loose from Crete didn't pay any attention to the word of God. What do you think his main concern was? What do you think the owner of the ship's main concern was? Sailing, getting to where I'm going, making the money, delivering the cargo, delivering the prison, the prisoners, keeping my shipping business going. And what end, what do they end up losing? The ship. The lousy prisoners, the murderers, and whoever else on here, all the lowlifes with Paul, all 276 of them, or maybe 74 of them, because Paul and Luke weren't two of them. Those guys all go free, and the owner of the ship loses the ship. He loses the thing that meant the most to him that he was really trying to save. That's what happens. Go against the word of God, do it your way, and you will lose what you are trying to grasp onto. Your little idol in your heart that you love so much that you're willing to do whatever you have to to have the word of God be damned, that little idol in your heart will be torn away. You lose your ship. So after rebuking you for not listening, the man of God will comfort you by telling you that you are eternally secure in God, though you will have or though you have and will continue to suffer temporal loss. It'd be a sad day to comfort a child of God, but at least you can tell him, hey, you're contrite, you've repented, you're showing evidence of salvation. Your life spiritually is not lost, but you're going to lose a lot temporally. You've lost, you think you've lost a lot. Now it's not over. You're going to have consequences that are going to follow you for a long time. This storm is not over. That's what the, what the preacher might have to tell you. The reason that they would be spared is because they were with Paul, whom Paul or whom God had decreed would go to Rome and stand before Caesar and preach to him and to his house while he was there. That was actually why they were spared. Acts 27, 23 through 24. There uh, for there stood by me, Paul says, this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. And I don't have time to get into that, but he's talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the angel of God. He's called the messenger of the covenant. In the book of Malachi, a messenger is, an, an angel is a messenger. The angel of God is Jesus Christ because he says, whose I am and whom I serve. Paul didn't belong to some angel, some, you know, created angel. He didn't serve some created angel. He served the Lord Jesus Christ, who's called an angel. Saying, Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So read between the lines. Why did those 274 low lowlifes end up making it to Rome? Because Paul was with them. Because in order for Paul to get to Rome, the 274 low lowlifes had to also. I say low lowlifes, I don't know. They were prisoners. They were accused of crimes. Maybe some of them weren't even guilty. I don't know. You get the point. Why did the other people make it to Rome? Because Paul needed to. And the Lord, I guess he could have just blown them all off the ship or something, but, you know, what's the point of that? They were um, the opposite of collateral damage. They were collateral blessing or whatever. They made it to Rome because Paul needed to get to Rome. What's the moral of that story? Hang out around righteous people. Hang out around good people. Spend time with them. 
you may be spared for their sake. And if you hang out around good people and righteous people, they might rub off on you too. And then you might be spared for your own sake. Uh, Philippians 1 and verse 13. Philippians 1 and verse 13. Paul says, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. That's why he had to go to Rome, because he went there to preach the gospel in the palace, in Caesar's palace. While in prison, in Caesar's palace, he preached the word. So much so that there were, there were converts there among Caesar's own household. Philippians 4 and verse 22. He says, All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Think of that. The, the emperor of the known world, his own family, maybe, or his own servants, or you know whoever, people in his own house, whoever they were, were converted to the, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the point that they're sending greeting to the other churches. That's why Paul made it to Rome, because he had that mission to do, and that's why the ship made it to Rome too. Like I said, being around godly people can be a blessing and save you from calamity. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, in Genesis 30 and verse 27. Genesis 30 and verse 27. It, it pays to hang around people like Paul. Genesis 30 and verse 27. Laban figured this out. It says, And Laban said unto him, that's unto Jacob, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. Laban was a shyster. He wasn't blessed for his own sake. He was blessed for Jacob's sake. He was Jacob was hanging around him, and therefore Laban got a blessing. It pays to hang out around godly people. Uh, in Acts 39, uh, 3-5, through 5, Acts 39, 3 through 5. Uh, uh, Genesis, Genesis 39, 3 through 5. This is with Joseph when he went to Potiphar's house. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him and made him overseer over his house and all that he had put his uh, put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. That Egyptian... For all we know, wasn't a godly man at all. He might have been a worshiper of, uh, I don't know, whoever the Egyptian god, Isis, Osiris, right? Some Egyptian god. We don't know. We don't know anything about him. But he was blessed, and his house was blessed because of Joseph. You remember Job, when he prayed for his friends? The Lord was upset with his friends, but he said, Have my, jo my servant Job pray for thee, and he would heal them. Right? Being around Job was going to be to their benefit. And being around Paul... I'll give you one more in Acts 27. Being around Paul was to these men's benefit. Acts 27, 44, 42, pardon me, 42 through 43. This is actually a second occurrence. So when they, we'll get to this next week. When they finally get to their port and they've made it, well, they get to another place, to Melita, which was not, um, not to Rome. They got to, he got to Rome later. But when they get to where they can finally get to land, Everybody's trying to get out of the ship, and the soldiers were just going to kill all the all the prisoners because they don't want to lose them. But because Paul was among them, and the centurion didn't want Paul to be killed along with the rest, all of them got spared for Paul's sake. Verses uh, 42 through 43. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass 
that they escaped all safe to land. The only reason why those prisoners were not killed was because of Paul. One man of God. And they weren't even following Paul. They just happened to be in the same ship. By the fortuitous hand of God, those people just happened to be there in that ship. If those prisoners would have been on any other ship with any other prisoner besides Paul, guess what? They'd have been dead. So they ought to have been thanking God to be around the Apostle Paul. They would be saved from death, but they would still not make it to their desired haven in the near term. Let's turn back. We're going to go, go back to where we left off there in Acts 27, 25 through 26. It says, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. This is Paul speaking to them on the ship. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. And what's the lesson here? God may eventually deliver you from the storm, but you will not end up in the place where you had planned to be or where you would have been. Had you obeyed God, you'd have been in a lot better place. You might have been in the place that you had intended and planned to be. But because of the storm, you're going to be blown off course and you're going to be in a far less comfortable place. When they got to Melita and they're warming themselves by the fire, yeah, it's a lot better than in the storm, but it's not exactly sitting in Caesar's palace in Rome, is it? You disobey God and you're going to be in a storm and you're going to be blown all around and you're going to be taken wherever the storm takes you and then you're going to be dumped off somewhere and it's not going to be nearly the place where you started or where you'd hoped to be. It's not going to be that nice place, though your life will be spared if God wills. I bet you never thought of any of that when you read through Acts 27 about the storm at sea, did you? Next time, we will finish up with the storm at sea, and then we will finish up with the persecution of the Apostle Paul and his martyrdom, and then we'll look at the saints at the end of time and how Jesus Christ comes back and saves them right there at the last minute. Just a quick note at the end of the sermon. The most important thing a believer in Jesus Christ can do is to be a member of one of God's true churches. If you're not already a member of one, go to pastorwagner.com slash churches to see if there is a true church or other believers of like faith near you. That's pastorwagner.com slash churches.